pretty awesome. I, I was thinking we might start off with, uh, mate, I'd love to know, Have uh, has anyone on the team ever been to um, Antarctica? <laughs> no. No? Well, but I, I know what you're getting at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yeah, I'm just wondering, like theoretically, if an alien being trapped deep in the, Ant- the Antarctic ice was accidentally unleashed upon the world, and being a learning organism, it managed to make its way to the civilized world. And uh, obviously, I'm talking hypotheticals here, like all hypotheticals. But uh, yeah, if it were to learn that you know the people of this planet were hyper paranoid and uh, extremely distrusting, isn't there a really strong chance that um, that this organism might be inclined to create some sort of uh, entertainment medium to either, uh, I guess, you know, uh, subversively present the idea of. Uh, of otherworldly beings to the people and make it either seem really silly or, uh, you know, or just accustomed to the idea of them existing in general so that they wouldn't be as scared when one showed up. Definitely. And with the being being, you know, uh, the creature or whatever, the alien being uh, a perfect Mm. organism for sure, uh, Mm. I think it would be inclined to go with the ultimate form of entertainment, which is video games with lots of microtransactions and loot boxes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I, I, you, you, is that the is that that the ultimate beings ultimate? Ga- I've I notice you know what else I've noticed is you're dancing around the word monster as well. I'm not I'm not I'm not crazy about saying the word monster either. I don't want to offend the being um if you know the being is out there not you know but uh yeah, ca- calling it a monster could be insensitive exactly but if it's all about the loot boxes and microtransactions there's a chance that it is a monster isn't there <laughs> <laughs> if it went with that monetization scheme then for sure then yeah it, it's a monster all right <laughs> um let's let's pretend that you're not being secretly controlled by an alien organism. Let's just pretend. Uh, how did you guys come up with the idea for Carrie in, in the first place? Uh, I get it was just, you know, childhood trauma and <laughs> <laughs> general life experiences of living in Poland. Oh, uh, yeah. Is there, are there a lot of labs that you have to break out of in Poland? Yeah, I'm not. I've been once, but I'm mostly stuck to um, to places that sell uh, pierogies. So uh, I don't really have a good idea of the lab culture yeah, in you know, Poland. Pierogies, polar bears, and and the labs. That's that's our daily life. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So, and it's worked really well in you know giving you a, a sense of uh, reverse horror. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Right, because um, I think the first time Job and I played this was in 2019, um, and the, the both of us immediately were like, "It's it's like you're playing in John Carpenter's mm. The Thing, like you're the creature." And <clears throat> having now played the game, um, th- there is obviously a lot of, uh, I guess, influences from The Thing and Alien and Predator, and I, I saw some some hints of Lost in there as well. Um, are, are there any other sort of TV slash movie inspirations that you've looked towards? I know there's like a film recently with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal oh, yeah. and Ryan Reynolds Life, called yeah. Life but, that, that's about yeah. scientists in space that come across yeah. this alien. Um, it, it wasn't an inspiration. Like It was pointed out to us that it, there are similarities there, but yeah, I think you named the, the most important ones being the, uh, the thing, obviously, Predator and, and Alien. That those were the three core uh, inspirations when it comes to movies, at least. Uh, and obviously, uh, Alien vs. Predator, the games, not not the movies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so the of idea of, of being <laughs> able to control either the, the xenomorph or, or the predator it was really awesome, and something that wasn't properly explored in a while, I think. Uh, so yeah, it was mostly that. Uh, plus our previous game Butcher was I mean it was hardly a reverse horror because it was more like a, a Doom or Quake turns into a 2D platformer but you were also generally a bad guy you know this cyborg which went 
on to exterminate humanity. Uh, kind of kind of Terminator inspired. So, kind of Terminator, yeah. That was yeah. Butcher, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. 2D platformer, uh, almost sold that style Terminator game. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think it was like a natural progression for us to go for the for the monster uh, genre with with the next game. What is it about uh, playing as the bad guy that appeals to you as a designer? I guess it's still relatively fle- fresh. Flesh. No. <laughs> also flesh in this case. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I think it just uh, kind of allows people to go with their own take on things, their own narration, uh, kind of automatically. If you're told you're probably the bad guy, or at least that's uh, that's what it looks like, uh, then. Mm. They kind of start developing their own theories and are much more invested into the idea. Like on our Discord, we've seen lots of different uh, lore ponderings and theories on what the monster is and and how it came to be, uh, etc. Uh, whereas if if it was a regular horror with people playing as something, and there were some monsters and those monsters rarely uh, inspire such such. Uh, Discussions. I think. Obviously, when you have something as awesome as as the alien, then, then yeah. But like most most horror creatures aren't that cool to uh, for people to invest themselves in them when they're just the villain and you see five minutes of them in the movie or in the game. You just oh, mm-hmm. it's a boss and it was cool and that's it. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a that's a really good, like, really interesting perspective. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but like, it makes so much sense. Like, it's uh, you, it allows you to do that. I mean, obviously, what I've played of Karen, you know, it has that minimalist narrative storytelling style. That uh, yeah, but at the same time, you're right. Like, I I do. I'm sitting there the entire time wondering, oh yeah, how, like, how did we come to this? So I think that's that's mm. really good. We, we also, um, in relation to the re- reverse horror sort of games, um, it, it seems like they're more in the multiplayer space these days with like allowing a person to be the bad guy and having um, like this asymmetrical gameplay of other people being the ones being hunted after. You're not really seeing a lot of these, um, at least, you know, putting the player in the shoes of the bad guy uh, in a single player game. They just don't really seem to be around. Yeah, there. they're few and far between. Yeah, that's true, and I don't really know why, to be honest. Hmm. Maybe, maybe we'll start the new thing in video games, and now everyone will go with the uh, with the single player reverse horror shtick. Yeah, be- because you, it's it's I guess giving the player this like power fantasy, right, of being this um, th- this what were we calling a monster creature. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, that is basically throughout the entire game you're pretty much just destroying everything in your path um, was, was that something that was always in the design from the, the initial concept of it or was it something that came on once you started developing the game? I think we set on the game being kind of like kind of about wrecking lots of stuff and, and being very interactive when it comes to the environment and, and ripping out heads together with the spine because that's how anatomy works uh, it was very early that I mean when you have a monster what does the monster do it's, it was pretty natural like, the other things uh, the, I don't know the general world design the metroidvania style progression and so on that, that came later but uh, this being very much about fucking some shit up that, that was there from the very beginning uh, in fact if mm. if you uh, dug up some early gifts from the from the very first prototypes uh, you'd see that it were basically like a katamari just <laughs> walking to run into uh, uh, people and, and absorb them automatically which was fun but it was like 5 minutes fun not 5 plus hours fun <laughs> so yeah. yeah we went for a more manual approach but yeah very early on it was just 
running to stuff, absorbing it. That's kind of fun. Mm. How many uh, how many mouths do you think is too many mouths? Just in general. There's no such thing as too many mouths. <laughs> that is horrifying. <laughs> That is just a disturbing thing to think about. Uh, um, you mentioned the Metroidvania style of Carrion. Um, uh, I noticed when I was playing the preview last time that uh, it was I found myself uh, getting lost a little bit. You guys to- toyed? Did you toy with the idea of a map? Was there anything actually that you wanted to add to Carrion but wound up cutting because it didn't really work, or you know uh, anything like that? I mean, we have lots of ideas that we didn't really get around to, to implementing for one reason or another. Either we decided that eh, it won't really work or oh, this would make it into a whole new game or would just be a feature creep and, and we'd never finish it. Uh, yeah. But I think uh, when it comes to the core, core design, core gameplay look, we have most of it there. Like, obviously we could always add some more reactions or even more streams and like <laughs> it was the only thing audio wise we said yeah we can never have too many screens so that was the only thing that didn't have a, a capacity or limit on it. it was just yeah more 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 because the soundtrack everything else yeah there is some something to it but screens to just keep on going we can always <laughs> use more <laughs> infinity screams infinity mouths <laughs> I have infinite mouths and I must infinitely scream. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Um, you, you've got a small team there as well, right? So I guess it's it's about like sort of picking the the core features that you want and making sure you can focus yeah, on definitely. those aspects yeah, of the game. Like right? The core uh, core team of let's say content creator so not including our sound designer and and composer uh who is chris velasco by the way you may know him from from resident evil 7 or some god of war titles uh mass effect and so on uh yes so it was basically me doing game and level design and sebastian the uh the brains behind the whole project the the guy who came up with, with this fucked up idea. Uh, he did all the programming and all the art. So we had to be pretty uh, pretty tight with what we decided to actually include in the game to not waste stuff on, uh, time on, and resources on stuff we thought maybe would be cool, but probably we have to cut it anyway. So I, pretty much all the cuts were done uh, on paper. like some stuff from the design document or, or we just, from our tasks in, in Asana or wherever, uh, we just decided, yeah, we are probably not doing that. And there was very little that we'd actually spent any time developing uh, that didn't make make it into the game. And, uh, you know, if it comes down to it, you could always wait, what, like 21 years and then release a prequel to Karen that nobody wants, right? Like with the yeah. thing? That worked well for the thing, I think. You know, everyone really liked the thing prequel, right? (laughs) 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 The the perfect organism seems to be a big hit uh, during um, the Devolver Direct when it was uh, uh, interacting with uh, Phil Spencer. Are you guys thinking about doing, like, um, merchandising now? With Phil? You know? (laughs) T-shirts with yeah. Phil Spencer. Yeah. TV shows. Oh. Why not? Why stop at merchandising? A sitcom, <laughs> a, a sitcom with uh, about Phil Spencer and uh, the monster being roommates. Yeah. I'd watch that. Yeah, exactly. The, the, <laughs> the odd couple. Like, just... <laughs> oh, the perfect organism is so messy. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving heads everywhere. Yeah, just oh, Is this your head? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, but in, in general we have some ideas for, for different uh, types of, you know, merch. Obviously t-shirts, plushies, whatnot, uh, carry-on hats, why not? Uh, but uh, I think mostly because of the pandemic, it's very hard to get something going, you know, physical and, and order it from somewhere, get it shipped. So yeah. uh, 
yeah, those plans yeah. were mostly postponed. I, I mean, we'll see. Maybe we'll get something going eventually, or for the uh, uh, carry on to Electric Boogaloo sequel, maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, currently we're mostly about the game itself, and and obviously we'll have the special reserve uh, physical uh, edition of of the Switch version, which is pretty cool. Nice. Uh, yeah, and oh, I'm going to spoil it. We'll most likely also have a release of, of physical release of of the soundtrack. Oh yeah, cool. It is a it's a it is a pretty like it's a very atmospheric soundtrack. What I've played of it anyway. Um, mm. Yeah, and it, like it suits the game really well. You've played the the sneak peek demo, right? So since then we've had lots of cool tunes <laughs> added and yeah. I think it, it works really well with the game. I'm pretty proud of of what Chris has uh, done for us. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, well, one thing I just want to touch on quickly was the, the movement in the game because it sort of feels like it evolves a little bit depending on what size you are exactly because you sort of start off as this like a little blob, but you can get to a point where it's a little bit like uh, you're more like a really long worm, and the the interaction between how you move within the environment is is sometimes very different from the, the initial start of the game, or, or depending on sort of what size you are. Um, was that really challenging to get right, or to to make it feel like it was working in in the world you've created? Yeah, uh, like. The very first months of, of prototyping, like pretty much the first six months of uh, development, were just Sebastian tweaking and programming all the all the physics-based movement, and it was really hard to to get it right. And even after that point, after us uh, doing the the prototype uh, demo that we. Uh, showcased uh, on some events and, and sent to to different publishers. We are still tweaking the, all that stuff, and I think that some tweaks were done even after the alpha sneak peek demo we played. So, like even a, a couple of months ago, we were still tweaking some movement uh, and especially eating or, or how the tentacles work. There's lots of lots mm. of. I mean, the physics and the maths are generally very simple. It's almost all based on on two spheres it's it's nothing uh, super complicated but just getting you know the numbers right and, and the general feeling and how the monster uh, moves and it actually does use the tentacles to, to pro- propel itself uh, in the direction you're going because some people thought it's uh, basically just like swimming or floating in the air that uh, the tentacles are just uh, yeah. uh, some for sure, you know. yeah, for for sure, just an animation. But it's it's not the case. It actually does uh, utilize the, the tentacles to move. In fact, uh, in the uh, full game, uh, early on, I added a very large semi-open area which didn't doesn't have the background, uh, just to show that without the background, the monster can't move because it utilizes. Let's say the depth of, of the level as well when it's moving, just make it more responsive. Uh, and then people go like, oh, so it's not floating in the area. I actually need to attach the tentacles to different surfaces, which is pretty cool, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. a really clever way um, to, to get people in... to make that connection, like without, you know, out and out saying it, because I don't think it's a game where you out and out say a lot. Yeah, we try to keep it as, as minimal as, as possible, basically. Yeah, because I, I remember when we first played it, it, it had this feeling feeling of like you can kind of go wherever you mm. wanted, um, but by I guess showing the player that no, that's not right. We're just gonna, you know, you've actually got to be attached to something. Um, do do you do anything in terms of the level design in order to um, sometimes make uh, or or to like have tricky areas where people can't get into uh, hidden areas that you've sort of played with the level design in, in certain situations or is it pretty basic in terms of showing players where they should be going? There are some hidden areas as so with some optional upgrades basically uh, but we try to make the main 
pathway, the, the main flow of the game. Make, make we try to make it fairly, maybe not streamlined, but obvious where you have to go. Uh, and it's more about mm. you know utilizing your skills, solving the puzzles, overcoming obstacles instead of just going oh crap, I go left, right, up, down, wherever. Uh, especially that we don't have uh, a map system, we have different hints, like you have uh, a collocation which points you to nearby hives or, or crevices, wall crevices in which you can set up a hive uh, and some, you know, environmental hints like where the exits are and so on. Uh, but uh, there is no outright map that would, like, the monster doesn't pull out uh, pen and paper and start drawing them up. Oh, I'm here now. <laughs> uh, and and I have this many chambers left to explore. So uh, it's more of a kind of from software approach, like Dark Souls or Bloodborne, that uh, levels can get mm. fairly complex and there's lots of uh, looping and, and shortcuts. But uh, in general, they're not designed uh, to make you get lost on purpose. It's, you generally know which direction you're going and it's only the secrets or or some additional uh shortcuts that are a bit obscure right yeah right um when you're play testing do you ever like find a human who doesn't shoot at you and then like you kill all the other humans but you specifically don't kill that one human and like you give them a name and and you like <laughs> sort of oh yeah that's that's Dan. Uh, Dan's okay. Dan's fine. And uh, yeah, and you just sort of look after Dan. Uh, maybe not look after, but yeah. <laughs> we do spur some humans at times. And this, this Dan, and, oh, here's Nigel. Yeah, let's keep him alive as well. Why not? <laughs> or we'll come back for him later. Because oh, yeah. There is some backtracking to the game, so <laughs> sometimes we revisit some places and having so- someone alive around is less cool in a way because you are like oh long time no see how are you doing how you doing look at me now look how big I am look at my yeah. powers <laughs> <laughs> Dan's all Dan doesn't really appreciate it Nigel Nigel's pretty rude as well that's why <laughs> you save Nigel for later but Dan gets to, Dan I think he can live through the entire affair in my opinion he, he earned it despite being himself being a good guy yeah just back into relation to the movement uh you can actually build up quite a lot of speed in the game when moving from uh you know even just between screens do you expect this game to be taken off in sort of like the speed running community and and seeing some absolutely insane <laughs> finish times with yeah this? i'm pretty sure that that some speedrunners will be very attracted to the, the movement mechanics and and ways you can optimize your uh, your path through the game, like because there's also this uh, as we call it mass-based class system. So depending on your current size, you have access to different skills, and you eventually you have to start uh, rotating those skills uh, and start actively thinking about what size you currently are. So uh, by knowing the levels inside out and and the puzzles and all the encounters, I think you can really optimize when you're which which form and and I think there's lots of uh, lots of uh, room for for the speedrunners to get creative and and optimize their tactics. Uh, in fact, uh, on our uh, Phobia Game Studio Discord, we already have some people speedrunning the the Alpha Sneak Peek uh, demo, and they got. I think under three minutes, two and a half, maybe. Right. I don't remember wow. the exact numbers, but they got some some good numbers out there. So I think that definitely there's going to be some uh, some community of of speedrunners going for for a speedrun of of Carion. I think it's it's pretty cool with with the momentum you can uh, gain and is you know. You being able often, not always, to, to sneak past some of the of the enemies and so on, so you can get through some levels very quickly. Whereas usually they take quite a lot of time to, to get through. So yeah, I think it it has some potential. At least I hope that 
screwdrivers will uh, will grow fond of it. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Um, I think we might wrap it up there, but would you like to let everyone know where you can find the game, I guess? Where can they find it? Where is it available? Uh, currently, you can pre-order it on, on Steam, on, on GOG, uh, and uh, Windows 10 Microsoft Store, and obviously also on Xbox and Switch. I think the pre-orders should be up and live already on, on those platforms. So, so yeah, basically, you can buy all, awesome. all of those at the same time. That would be oh, awesome. at the same time. Yeah, just yeah. slap it all down. Yeah, that's like just fun. <laughs> get them all. Yeah, gotta catch them all. <laughs> gotta catch them all. Hey, um, I, I, uh, I didn't want to derail Luke's extremely good points about the movement too much, but uh, before we go, uh, you mentioned that you were going to do plushies before. How many mouths would the plushies have, and how many of those mouths do you think people would have sex with? I think we should have like uh, <laughs> detachable Velcro mouse, so we could customize the plushie with as many mouse as we could. And you know, mouse, mouse DLC, you can just buy expansion packs with with more mouse and just throw them on. And, yeah, and you are the perfect them. organism, aren't you? Yeah. Look at you. you, you and, you're thinking and, about it, this stuff on the fly. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then have sex with every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well of course well of course yeah excellent <laughs> uh thanks i'm glad we sorted that out <laughs> um thanks so much for joining us um uh, taking taking time out while uh you know obviously you're like a week away right from the game launch yeah it launches on 23rd so that's nine days away nine days that's crazy yeah um so yeah, we're very grateful that you took the time to to chat with us uh, yeah. about Carrion. Uh, we're very excited to play the full thing. Yeah, thanks for and, inviting uh, me. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, monster right. sex is always cool. So, oh man, how good is it? <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, see you later. See you. See you later. See you. See you later. See you. <laughs>